Welcome to Knight Foundation Discovery, a weekly show webinar thing where we talk about arts and society and its role in our communities. I'm Chris Barr, Director of Arts and Technology Innovation at Knight Foundation. And this week we're excited to talk about how we might reimagine monuments in our public spaces and beyond. And my guests this week are Paul Farber. He's Artistic Director and Co-Founder of Monument Lab and serves as a senior research scholar for the Center, Center for Public Art and Space at the University of Pennsylvania's School of Design. And Karen Olivier, who's a Philadelphia-based artist who works across a range of media, including public art, sculpture, photography, and installations. She's exhibited her works at the Studio, for Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of Art, MoMA PS1, and many others. And she's an associate professor of art and sculpture at Temple University. Welcome to you both. Thank you. It's, it's really great to have you here to discuss uh, this topic. It's one that uh, obviously is, is in our media at the moment. Uh, I'm sitting in Raleigh, North Carolina, as you know, where uh, several Confederate monuments have come down uh, in front of our state house. We've had other monuments in our city uh, come down and there's a public reckoning uh, with monuments. And, and where I thought we might start, um, because you all have been thinking about these issues for a while, is just to grapple with what is a monument. Uh, how, can, how, do, how do we start first defining what a monument is and what its role is in our, in our spaces? Uh, and, and really tap into the question of why are we reckon it, reckoning with them right now? So you maybe start. we'll start with you, Paul. <laughs> uh, well, first I wanna just um, thank everybody for being here today with us. Um, I see some, some names of folks who recognize and, and others looking forward to getting to know. And, and of course, thank you, Chris. Um, and to the Knight Foundation for your ongoing support and, and it's great to be thought partners with you and to be here with dear collaborator Karen Olivier is, is always a treat. Um, for Monument Lab, we define monument as a statement of power and presence in public. And that definition um, has kind of come out of uh, research, curation, uh, art making for the better part of a decade that was meant to account for the ways that we think traditionally about monuments in bronze and marble, um, elevated figures um, that are kind of put above us or as spectacles. But we also wanted to know when we thought about monument, all of the ways that people powered commemoration, resistance, activation has informed our idea of history. You know, monuments, um, despite uh, what, what uh, some apologists for racial terror, for example, would tell us about Confederate monuments, monuments do more to shape the past than the past shapes our monuments. They're mu as much uh, products of the moment that they're produced um, than they are about any kind of eternal statement on, on history. And so we've looked to the ways that um, everyday residents, artists, activists have left imprints on their city and history. And, and it is possible that whether it's visual artists, poets, musicians, have um, powerful things to say. And it's not, you know, if we're as interested in what is officially known as a monument as to what's unofficially marked, because that's where the interesting interplay and also new possibilities for justice and democracy um, go hand in hand when we're thinking in public. Yeah, absolutely. I was also thinking about how monuments traditionally offer a single perspective, which we know has to, is false because it's supposed to be the universal and history is right. always multiplicitous and simultaneous. So there can't be this one representation of an event because we know of, we know that can't be true. I was also thinking about what you're saying in terms of invisibility. I was thinking about uh, Robert Musil, Musil, who wrote this quote, said something about the monuments are, by definition, they become invisible despite their material weightiness, despite the spectacle, despite their intention and declaration of being permanent and being authoritarian, in a way we don't see them anymore. But I started to think, what does it mean if we don't see them? Is it because on some level that invisibility is kind of put into the monument? Mm -hmm. The idea that if we don't see them, they become a natural part of the landscape, right. which could be kind of, kind of, um, 
kind of a, almost almost like um, rep rep repressive act, the idea of it being invisible. We don't we think it's natural that this is. So what does that mean? That the kind of the range from the status quo to like this repression it represents. Yeah, I, 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 I'm so interested in this sort of tension uh, between the idea that many see these things as eternal and permanent. And what uh, both of you are pushing back on is monuments can and should be about the present. And I think a lot of the work the Monument Lab does is about prototyping, is about um, uh, trying these things in public. And, and this is where uh, you two came together to collaborate. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, that work that you did together and the impermanent nature uh, of that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, no monument is permanent, despite its aura, despite its weight, despite even the way we talk about it. Monuments require maintenance funds and mindsets to stay up. And, you know, when you take those things away, um, we're reminded monuments like any other kind of element in the built environment, but us too, no one's permanent. Mm -hmm. We can communicate across generations. We can communicate in long standing ways, but you know, I think it's important that, and, and why I, um, you know, I'm so grateful for collaborations with Karen and with um, the other artists from Monument Lab is that they've pushed the idea of what's expected. And they're reminding us of that fact that there is no such thing as permanence. There's actually relationships and contingencies and investments that we make for stewardship and care. Um, so just the story of our, our collaboration, um, you know, back in um, about 2015, we started working on a citywide exhibition in Philadelphia that was a public art and history project. We partnered with Mural Arts Philadelphia um, 10 municipal agencies, numerous community organizations, um, and, and our organization, um, which we uh, co-founded with Ken Lum and a number of other really great researchers, artists, and, and organizers, um, we set out to ask a question to the whole city. What is an appropriate monument for the current city of Philadelphia? Mm -hmm. um, and we worked for a few years um, with artists on this project before it went, went live in the fall of 2017. And um, Karen Olivier, as uh, an esteemed artist, we now think of her as a Philadelphian after many years of teaching in Philadelphia. Um, um, we wanted to think with Karen about what she, how she would answer that question in a park that was close to where she lived, Vernon Park in the neighborhood of Germantown. And then um, while our project took place in the five central squares of, si of the city, including City Hall, Rittenhouse Square, neighborhoods were really important to this. Um, project. And just for those who don't know the, the area, Vernon Park um, marks a site going back to, um, of course, indigenous time and, and uh, Philadelphia pre-colonial, where the Lenape people, um, who are the ancestral people of the land, had a walking trail adjacent to where the park now sits. Mm -hmm. um, during the colonial period, um, the Revolutionary War was fought nearby, uh, a key loss by General Washington's troops that is commemorated each year. Um, and then since then, you know, all kinds of other historic events, including um, former President Barack Obama speaking in that park in a few years ago. And we asked Karen, what do you see in this park? What would you want to build here? What's an appropriate monument? And I remember the site visit that we did a, a year before the project. And just that's in the fall of 2016. This is before Charlottesville and the Unite the Right rally. This is before Dallas and New Orleans taking down Confederate monuments. But let's be clear, this is still years into the movement that we're seeing the fruits of right now, the full reckoning and reimagining of monuments. And I just remember this moment when, you know, Karen, you said something to me that really stuck with me, which, you know, you said, I'm really interested in bringing something to this park, but I want to work with what is already here as a way to mark presence, but also absence. And that as a philosophy for a monument, like mm. it really shook me and it stays with me to today. And, I'll pass it off to you to, to go from there. And, yeah, I, and I'm just going to pull up for folks. Uh, I'm just going to pull up an image while you're talking, Karen, so folks can yeah. see what we're talking about. I feel as though I'm always thinking about the what if. I'm always thinking about what is presented. What do I, what is here? But knowing that there are things that are always hidden for reasons of class, race, power, all those reasons. So I'm thinking 
all I need is already here. So what can I do that kind of reveals a history that we don't know about? And then if we think about this history, what does it mean to consider that with a present day narrative? So I was very intrigued by this, the Battle of Germantown Memorial, uh, Memorial, which I wish I had an image of that as well. So that was about, that was a failed battle, the only Revolutionary War battle that took place in Philadelphia. But in the far corner of the park was a monument dedicated to Francis Daniel Pistorius, who was an early German settler who led the first Quaker protests against slavery back in 1688. And I found out that during World War I and II, his monument was boxed over. So you think about what does it mean for that monument during those wars? And we can kind of imagine why those were boxed over, because we're seeing the repetition of that today, um, the xenophobia in, in that way. So I thought, what would it mean for me to transcribe history from one time onto another history? So I thought if I boxed over the George Washington Memorial, one, it speaks about two, two different men fighting for liberation. George Washington fighting for America's liberation for British rule while owning slaves. You have a German who's trying to become American, who's fighting for blacks and seeing a population. So what would it mean to, me to put these, these monuments in conversation with each other? I always think about history, how history isn't revealed to us kind of on this platter. Things get unearthed, evidence gets revealed. So all of a sudden, this new evidence of what is highlighted or spotlit all, all of a sudden makes us question what we assumed or our assumptions about what our history was. So by covering it, I wanted, I felt like that was a way to kind of dispel or take away the hierarchy of monuments or the way we think about the Y axis. What would it mean for me to engage the Y and X axis? What would it mean for you to kind of see a monument that's never sitting still? The monument is never static. Every moment it is shifting because of the the, the temperature, the, the climate, because of the people walking. So what would it mean for this thing to be unfixed, mutable, alive? What does it mean that I am reflected in the monument? So what does it mean for me to have to become the monument? I'm the keeper and the protector of democracy. What does it mean for this to be another reenactment, very similar to the way that the battles get reenacted every year? Mm -hmm. It's another way of understanding history. Yeah, and, and I, I want to just... I want to add a note of profound appreciation for, for Karen's brilliant intervention and her broader work. And and because I know that there are a few public art officers on this call and others who are, you know, part of the, the public art and history community, um, cite her work, but also call Karen because she had an approach that I think could play out in any number of cities. This was, you know, as we were talking about with like many invisible monuments, this monument is um, known, but it's it's kind of the everyday furniture of that space. It's not looked upon as a controversial site. It's not a Confederate memorial or clearly, right? It is is dedicated to a, a lost battle of the Revolutionary War. Um, but Karen asked, you know, put, put into play this idea. We asked how monuments reflect us and reflect our values. And while making that literal by making a mirror that reflected everyone around, it was so sophisticated, it was so thoughtful. And we talk about community engaged art and there's all kinds of different ways that that's measured or calibrated. Sometimes as artists have, you know, a multi-year project where they get to know people in a community or they're of the community. Um, there are other ways, but I will tell you, like when the monument was going up, before it ever went up, there were meetings with local artists and local community organizers that Karen is a part of. And just the care that put in there was precise. When the monument was going up, the installation is not a neutral time either. And so I know Karen shared with me and I saw firsthand all of the conversations back and forth. There were part, that's part of the artwork. And then once the artwork went up, we had all these plans, like what would happen if it was vandalized or what would happen, what people would say about it. And Karen, you know, you said, trust people, trust that people will understand it. And not only was it never vandalized, but um, it was cleaned once a week by like a self-appointed conservator a woman in the neighborhood who took it upon herself. There were prayer circles. Um, there were, of course, selfies, but there were also other kinds of gatherings. And just when you went to the park, sometimes you'd see it as the most important symbol there. And other times it would disappear from the landscape. So that's why I say like cite Karen's innovation and think of, think of her as part of already, when we're thinking about what are our solutions in 2020, Karen's body of work shows us that over a long period of time. Oh. <laughs> uh, and Karen, I, I want to see if I can uh, ask you to talk a little bit about your work witness in Kentucky as well, because I think there are similar strategies happening within that work. Uh, and for folks who aren't aware, this is this work is 
uh, uh, being talked about in the New York Times, and I, I think we just shared in the chat uh, Karen's Washington Post op-ed uh, around how this wor her work witness uh, works in relation to another um, mural in the same space. And if, if you wouldn't mind talking about that. No, I think it started with, well, okay, I'll, I'll speak about the work. Um, at the University of Kentucky, there's a New Deal era mural by Ann Weissel Hanlon, a Kentuckian. And the, the charge was to make a, a illustration of the history of industrialization of Kentucky. So looking back at the mural, of course, it shows a sanitized version of history. It shows um, stereotypes of um, a Native American, only one lone Native American looking as though he's about to attack the, the lone white woman. You know, slaves in the center, you know, black musicians performing. So you see, so there are things that are problematic, definitely problematic, but also it reveals obvious racism. And there's, and it's been contested for about 30 years. I was brought in, the president decided to cover the mural for a couple of years to figure out what the community, what we should do. And he'd spent two years of talking to the community, the meetings, the rigor I had to go through to get my proposal to go through. So it was pretty intense process, but it was, was great in a way. But I decided, why don't I, I don't want to add something new again. It's already there. Why don't I use what's there? So what I decided to do in the vestibule was to, in the dome ceiling, which made you think, why is there a dome ceiling here? I decided to gold leaf it. And all the black and brown figures from the original fresco, I replicated them and put them there. So all of a sudden now, these anonymous subjugated figures are now seen, or they're allowed to exist without whiteness. It could also speak about being able to think of them in reference to Renaissance churches and Byzantine churches and the gilded. And now I started thinking about George Floyd and his, the gold casket, my relationship to that. And then I also, there were these four medallions in the space and I decided to have um, portraits of four underrepresented um, Kentuckians. And it's caused controversy because of course with the George Floyd, the movement, it was a moment where the president of the university thought of a quick thing to do. I could take, people have been complaining about this mural, let's take it down. And I just felt as though this is such an extraordinary time. This is not the time to make a, a rash decision. And I was thinking about the decision to make right at that op-ed happened after that HBO decision pulled, gone with the wind, and they're gonna reinsert it once there's context. And I was like, made me think, okay, Confederate monuments have to go. Um, Columbus statues have to go. Are there works that are in that are, are there problematic works from the 20th century that could be useful? Are there any that are nuanced or that could be a tool, a catalyst? And I thought maybe this is, we are at a, we're at a, a place of higher education where this is the site where we can reckon with and actually go in and deal with the pain and the, the horror. Mm -hmm. So I thought, what would it mean to like kind of use these works along with programming and all this? So that's kind of like the background to it. But then in the end, the president has kind of decided instead of doing the, the hard work of kind of making, using these as two tools, he decided the quick symbolic act is to take this, take this down as opposed to dealing with the fact that the faculty is saying, why there's so, so few black faculty? Why is there no this? Why is there no this? This is the easy one. And he's like, you already set it up to make this useful. Like artwork should be a catalyst. It's a space for discourse. There's a role for polemics. Like things can't be, it shouldn't be, it's not. I mean, and I said to them, I can't tie the race problem up in a both of you. You're gonna to have to deal with the institutional <laughs> supremacy, white supremacy in your school. But this is like a site, like James Baldwin says, artists, the our role of the artist is to ask the question, the answer hides. So this is to add a space for questioning, a space of pain. It's also like the protest, a space for healing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. And, and this idea that art creates a space for discourse. I know, Paul, that uh, a lot of your work is around the critical examination of monuments. And, and I wonder if you could share a little bit about the field trip project that you all have started and the toolkit that, that will, can potentially help communities and others around the country uh, go through these critical examinations and, and create discourse around uh, what exists in the symbolic realm of our public space. Yeah, um, you know, inspired um, in part by the pandemic, inspired by um, the, the movement for Black Lives um, and the, the reckoning around monuments, um, but also our, our kind of years of work thinking at, with people about public spaces in public spaces. We wanted to 
um, create something called the Monument Lab Field Trip. And you know, this is a, a, a tough year, profoundly to say the least, where there won't be field trips um, as we know them for schools. And so we thought, well, what's a, what's a way to imagine a Monument Lab field trip? It's utilizing, you know, in the spirit of, of as Karen was saying, like what we have in front of us, right? That um, there's no neutral public space. There's no neutral monument. Um, you know, as I see a number of people in the chat and the Q&A point out, you know, that kind of legacy of trying to just add new layers on top without dealing with what's beneath it or what's behind it or who is missing, who's been displaced and what forces have displaced them. We thought let's come up with an activity that anyone can download for free. Um, that is um, of course kind of looks like it's for kids but it's truly, it's all ages. We worked with two fantastic artists um, from Portland, Super Fun Nature Adventures um, who we met because one of the, the partners, Mike Mirowski, uh, is one of the kind of instigators of the hashtag museums are not neutral, along with Latanya S. Autry. And we started thinking, like, what would a field trip be that could do the work in part to put out some tools for anyone? But we said, like, let's imagine seventh graders. Let's imagine um, I've done led tours for amazing groups of, of um, retired folks, of um, social groups, and you work with what you have. And so the idea is, um, one, you can do it from home using virtual tools, but if you feel like it's a safe context to be outside with a monument and go and find one as a case study and really take a look at it, don't walk by it, don't drive by it, but really see what you can know and also what you can't know. And then we try to ask a question of, you know, cause so many monuments are to single figures of history. We know history doesn't happen because a white guy on a horse looks off into the distance. Yeah, we, we settle for that. Um, but we said, all right, every time you see a person on a pedestal, come up with a list of the people who made their elevation and our knowledge of them in history possible. Everyone who is associated with them, everyone whose uh, work they benefited from. Um, and of course the context here, because many of our monuments are dedicated to people who also benefited from the institution of slavery is to think about their role in exploitation. And you know, it, there's not one kind of monument. So with this field trip, you may go to a site of um, Benjamin Franklin or Thomas Jefferson, but you may also see a monument to Harriet Tubman. Um, and how do we think about collectives of people who are making history, not in one instant or flashpoint, but across time? How do we speak across generations? Um, and you know, part of this, uh, also is like going to pick, pick a place that doesn't have a monument, but try to imagine both with your, with your kind of speculation, but also with a little bit of research, like what was there five years ago, a hundred years ago, 400 years ago, especially to think about forms of representation that are often missing from our monuments, especially acknowledging the, not just the past of colonialism or systemic racism, but the way that those legacies shape our present. Um, and then finally, you know, there's a part to design and propose a monument and think about what that would be. And, um, you know, I think what, what we've already heard, we, we led a group um, talking about the field trip of high school educators in LA, New York, and Mexico City. Um, I know of a few graduate schools that are using this, but also fourth grade classrooms. And I, I feel like while we are definitely in the midst of a profound challenging moment, how actually can we have intergenerational conversations about um, all of the things, and Karen, you mentioned it, that it's, it's both the symbols, but it's also the systems. Where, how do we resource our spoken values of inclusion? How do we acknowledge the systems of exclusion that are, that are actually really important to talk about because they're still in operation? But how to put the fun in fundamental and like bring that in with field trip so that it's something you can download. And we'd love to hear from people who use it because it might lead to future chapters and by having it on a piece of paper, you can break it and answer whatever question you want to and take it in your direction. I love this. I love, because I love that it's, it's proposing the what if, what would it mean to be reimagining what citizenship is? I, I can, and I love the idea of like being, having people think, yes, a drawing could be the monument. I think about, I always think about that it's supposed to be the most dispersed monument memorial um, with the brass plaques in front of the homes of uh, a Holocaust victim. I like the idea that it can exist as this dispersed thing. It could be ephemeral. It could last for, it could be a, one conversation. That one, I still think about this one conversation I had with a neighbor 
about that piece. To me, that was a monument in itself, even though it was fleeting. So I like this idea that was it mean for it to be as powerful on a piece of paper, or even just that you let yourself imagine. That's the thing, the reimagining. Yeah. Um, we, we have a question from, from folks who are watching, and this one plays into my space at Knight Foundation. Uh, does tech play a role in this process? And if so, how can we use tech to reimagine monuments? And, and I know, Paul, you have some experience here. Yeah, I mean, we've, we think about it a lot. And for us, we're, is interested, we're interested in um, technology in context. So the analog and the digital and where they meet and even where they break down, that's the area that we're really interested in. Um, we've had the great opportunity to be supported by the Knight Foundation, including um, the, the Art and Technology Prototype Fund, um, to think about and experiment with augmented reality as one of those examples. And, it, and it's complex because I feel like technology um, in of itself will not save us. In fact, technology has the propensity to harm us. Um, so what is the practices, the values behind technology? How do we think about technology in context? And just to give an example, you know, for Monument Lab's work, um, we are, we always are collecting data. It's messy data. It's data that we do the work of putting it into municipal repositories and open data systems, but it's handwritten paper forms that are, um, you know, entered manually and then translated into data and then can be utilized and have been to argue for new monuments, new historic markers. Um, but I think back to like early on when we first started, um, we had a group of student advisors and I came to them with an idea. It was a very bad idea, but I'll just say what it was quickly. I was like, all right, we're gonna make an app that can design any monument. It will have all the different kinds of um, features and it'll be on an iPad and it will take five minutes. What do you think? And this group of students said, uh, no one has five minutes for you. They don't know you. Have you ever tried to use an iPad outside? What if it's raining? What if there's no power? You're communicating to people, if you have iPads in front of you, they're looking at you in public space from 100 feet away, that you have something that's not for them that you're eventually gonna take out of their hands um, more heavy handedly. So think of the whole experience as the interface. Think of when someone sees you from 100 feet away and you're doing a project outside and they're looking at you for a month and they need to see from that far away that they feel safe, secure, and that's a welcome space for them. When they come in, understand that there's an exchange and mutuality, they're donating their time. There might even have to be a reciprocity of, of some kind of gift or offering. And then make the final part of that interaction when they hand off a piece of data and they see it being counted. So go to great lengths to show them it being scanned, show them a dot on the map. Mm -hmm. And that has guided our principles where the whole interaction from the moment we step outside is the interface to the moment you see it in a data stream. And, and for me, that's the kind of thinking around technology, understanding can do harm, but it can also do good if you have relationships, face-to-face -face or person-to-person -person that are part of the, the equation. So I, I think one final question as, as we uh, come to the end of our time, um, and this is to both of you, how do you think cities, governments, uh, parks departments, uh, folks who are concerned with public spa space, place-making enthusiasts, how do, how do those folks work better with artists, with activists and communities uh, to really bring to life new ideas around what monuments and public memorial, public memory is really all about? It seems like such a no-brainer. Have us included at the beginning. Don't bring me in. Karen, we need a memorial for this. We need a... No, we should be part of it from the beginning and listen, right? And trust that our skills, our skills have the same amount of value as the organization that has the money. Like, you have to trust us, you know? That to me is like, listen and trust us and include us from the beginning. Yeah. I just echo that. Artists have their ear to the ground. They're prophetic. They see things before they come into um, the kind of larger recognition. And, you know, I've seen this go really well, where someone, you know, says, we're going to build a memorial. 
we're actually going to start from the same point. We don't know what that will look like. We have values that we need to work on. We need to think about that. Let's put our values in our budget and in the time that we spend. I've seen it on the flip side where artists come in, where everything is cooked, where people clearly want to check off a box that says community engagement. And mm -hmm. I'll ask people when they're sponsoring community engagement or, or participation, what do you want to learn? Do you have anything you want to learn? If you already know the answers and this is performa, then you're not, you're going to have pushback. Mm -hmm. So I think just to be clear, like it's, especially at this moment where everyone is sacrificing, around COVID and the economic crisis we have, investing in artists is not just money well spent, it's about your values and your visions. And so this is true of a public art office, but this is true of the sanitation department, uh, it's true of the city manager, it's true of public property, it's true of schools. Artists from the beginning through the middle and the follow through in the end um, are gonna push us and are gonna help us think in holistic ways that are about the reckoning that's necessary, but also the reimagining and the fostering connectivity. I, I and really with, love and that. I, and one, one other thing with that is like, and it's not resolved. Yeah, that's right. Now the thing is done, it's not resolved. It should, there's always a bit of perpetual resolution that should be happening, right? Because if we're open to right. that resolution, it will lead to the next. Yeah. So it can't be like, done, right? Yeah, I think to that point, like I just, I was, talking about this recently, the rush is to not fix a problem to make it go away. The rush is to repair, to yeah. listen, to understand. And that's going to have long-term profound impacts for the way we, our democracy lives in public and the way we live together. Well, that's so wonderful. And, and you know, with that closing thought, invest in artists, uh, I think uh, is, is the ringing headline. Uh, I want to thank you both, uh, Karen and Paul. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm sure there are more questions that folks have, and uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, this will be on Facebook Live. It's archived there. If folks want to watch back uh, later. And, the chat, and, the questions too? and the I'm not sure that the chat is on Facebook, but there, there are comments on Facebook as well, and I'm sure uh, we can engage there. Uh, more if folks want to head over to that venue or, or tag us on Twitter. Uh, again, thank you so much for your time today uh, and the great work that you're doing in our communities. Uh, really, we can't, we can't express our thanks enough. Thank you so much, Chris, for having us here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. This was wonderful. Take care.